All right, if you've been following me for the past year, you probably noticed that I spent a majority of my 2019 on how to find SSRFs. The biggest part of my research was when I identified that a lot of PDF generators uh, tend to be vulnerable to SSRF, especially if you have an XSS on the website already. So if you're not familiar with SSRF, I will put a link below in the description where I did a stream on how to export SSRF and how to find them. With that said, let's get into it and let's talk about SSRF. This SSRF itself, it's a little bit special to me because uh, not only I got to collaborate with a number of hackers, I also found this vulnerability on accident. So before I get into the details of this vulnerability, I wanna make it clear that unfortunately, the company that was involved did not want to be a part of this video, and unfortunately, I can't disclose the name of this company. For the sake of this video, I'm going to refer to this company as a delivery slash rideshare app that allows you to print your receipts into a PDF and expense it to your employer. And as always, the biggest part about the research and the fun that comes with it is that I found all of this by accident. Uh, the way I came across this was that this company allowed you to get free products if you were to use your business email and expense it to your company. So what I did was I just wanted to expense my reports for a particular trip to HackerOne and as a joke, I put an HTML tag within this expense where it allowed me to put a note that says what was this expense for. So this happened six months before I actually noticed there was a vulnerability because I never got around using that PDF as an expense. So when I was traveling to Chicago, for a conference uh, I went to my email and I noticed that I had sent myself an old email with a PDF that contained a list of expenses that has been emailed to me automatically by this company when I opened the PDF uh, within the PDF itself there was a huge h1 tag that said test one two three that caught my eyes and kind of made me realize that i had put this payload in my expense notes and then later on was embedded within this pdf and being on a plane there was no way of me being able to exploit this and order more rides or deliveries uh, while i'm in the air so what i did was uh, a big shout out to donut uh, go follow him on twitter at donut ptr he actually uh, offered to take a ride for me to go get food and come back to his work. And this was how I actually was able to confirm that this vulnerability still existed. But unfortunately, I didn't get to exploit this because I was on my phone. Every time I was putting this payload in, I was doing it through my phone. And anytime I would give it the quotation, it was doing the wrong quotation mark. And it actually wasn't allowing me to close or include any images or any iframes within this PDF. So in other words, I was giving it the wrong tags and therefore it wasn't actually doing any request out to reach for any of the files that I was giving it to. And if you're not very familiar with SSRF, the reason why it's so important to be able to embed an image or any other remote files, it's because it reveals what user agent this backend is using, which kind of tells us what we're going against. So for my case, with this one that I was exploiting, it came back and showed me that Wheezy print was actually the backend used to generate this PDF. Months later, while I was in New York for H1212 with Cody, okay, a Dakin, we actually noticed that I was using the wrong quote and we figured out a way to break out of the HTML and not only break out of the HTML, but actually include an image within the PDF that kind of leaked the header. So the header showing that Vuzi print was the back end. Quickly with a Google search, we actually noticed that it's an open source project and we can actually review the source to figure out how we can exploit this further. So it is always very, very important to make an out of bound connection and reaching out for an image, an iframe of some sort to leak the user agent of that back end so you understand exactly what you're going against and also to look for vulnerabilities that may exist or have been found by other researchers. And the reason why I call it out of bounds instead of a remote file is to make sure you understand that we're not going to load or fetch any internal images or files until we know what the user agent is. I'm not saying that this is a requirement, but that's the first step I always take to identify what the back end is. It kind of makes my life easier and it also gives me a way to keep myself busy and 
important to understand how everything works. But now let's talk about Wheezy Print itself. So the way Wheezy Print works is that you type in Wheezy Print, you give it a HTML template file, and you also give it an output PDF. So all you type in for the backend on the uh, terminal to get it to work is Wheezy Print, file.html, file.pdf, and whatever is in that HTML gets converted to PDF later. And it gives that, uh, it outputs that for you within a terminal. So I assume that the user's information gets put into that HTML file somewhere, somehow within some functions, later on gets passed to Wheezy Print, and Wheezy Print just spits out a PDF, and that is given to the user itself. So while we were doing this, the biggest problem that we had was Wheezy Print actually limited the number and the kind of HTML tags it can actually use within this PDF. So for example, if you wanted to use any HTML for styling like H1, U, bold, whatever other basic tags you wanted to give it for the text that would actually work. But when it came down to outside resources, things like audio, iframe, image, and embedded files objects were all very, very limited. So it was really cool that we figured out what backend this was using and having access to that source code was very, very, very valuable to us. So I mentioned the source code a number of times and I kind of want to stress this out because if we didn't know the source code was out there and was open source, then we would have to do all of this blindly and test for the solution that we came up with very, very blindly. And more than likely, we probably wouldn't have figured it out. So as an example, we ran through all the uh, tags that we found valuable, like image, embedded object, and we saw that none of these were working. But if you actually reviewed this file, html.py, within that file, you could see that there is a tag called link that they actually allow you to use within your PDFs. I'm honestly not sure why the link tag was actually available. But I guess at the end of the day, it's up to the customer using this product to make sure that the user input is being fully sanitized to prevent the use of any other malicious HTML code. So once you had used this attachment tag and you would have put this file into the PDF, it wouldn't actually present it within the PDF itself. You actually have to decompress the file and pull all that information out. We only figured this out because while Cody and I were fuzzing this, Cody accidentally attached a larger file than the one we were after and the PDF itself became huge. So for example, if he was to attach a local file in his system that was eight gigs, the PDF would also include all of that file and the rest of that PDF within it. And that's kind of what the red flag was for us that why is this file so huge? And going back through our history, we realized that we actually attached the wrong file to it. And therefore the file size itself was a lot bigger than we thought or expected. So now that we knew that we have some way to attach any files, we actually found out that using the same exact HTML tag, we're actually able to include any HTTP request within an internal or outside network and capture the response from those requests within this PDF. And then obviously we can use tools like PDF Detach, Zlib, or Binwalk to kind of decompress these PDFs and pull out the data that we wanted. So overall, after we were able to exploit this fully, it actually gave us access to the AWS metadata instance keys. And also we could read any files within that network. You don't read files within the network. And if you're thinking about where you may have seen this exact vulnerability later on, we actually use this as a part of HackerOne's $50 million CTF, where uh, a bunch of hackers were actually able to own Wheezy Print on their own and uh, submit the flag that was for that CTF. So it took me uh, a few months to actually exploit this. And once we put out the CTF, we actually realized that it was a lot easier for hackers to figure this out than we actually thought. So the best part is to realize that it may take some people longer like myself, but for some other hackers, it was instant. And some of these folks were actually able to exploit this within hours or even um, minutes. And of course, if you're interested in the $50 million CTF, I'll leave a link down below for you to read all the write-ups that came out of the CTF to kind of help you understand this bug further. And I'll also link my DEF CON talk where this was covered within the same description down below. And last but not least, I wanted to say thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, make sure you like and subscribe to my channel. Uh, give this video a thumbs up and also let me know what other videos you want me to make and if there are any particular topics you want me to cover. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.